Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wonder Fighters Meetup number eight. We made it to eight. Yay. And today we're going to hear from Roland about reinforcement learning. And later we'll hear from Steve about how to get hired in the midst of the current situation. And in between, we'll also hear from a couple of other people with some interesting updates as well. But yeah, without further ado, Roland, the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Karina and Paul, for inviting me. This is really exciting. It's my first talk, and I hope I'm going to do a great job. So thank you, everyone, for joining me on this talk. I'm really excited to be speaking today about deep reinforcement learning, specifically discuss how deep reinforcement learning is being applied in the industry, in the robotics, and in locomotion. OK. So a little bit about me. I'm a fresh UCL graduate with a bachelor's in electrical engineering. I'm currently working with Google Brain on Jackson Flex as part of the Google Summer of Code program as a student. And I'm also recently started at Rival as a research engineer. OK, so in this talk, we're going to start by presenting the classical approaches uh, of handcrafted controllers for robotics. We will then have a brief introduction to the field of reinforcement learning and then catch up with the latest work in the applied AI field uh, for locomotion. Finally, I'll be listing a couple of resources for you to get started in the field. Make sure to hang around for beers and pizzas after the talk. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with these. For the past couple of years, the internet has been flooded with videos and GIFs of these silly looking robots walking around, doing parkour, dancing, and being abused by the owners. One might say that they will use this footage to take revenge on us in the future. Well, while this is the common expectation since the media, robots taking over. <laughs> However, uh, as reality, uh, reality can sometimes be a bit disappointing. The real world is ever changing. And the reason why these robots are prone to failure and error is because they can only be designed for specific tasks. Thus, many factors cannot be in taken into consideration when designing these robots, especially consciousness, especially intention, which, yes, <laughs> is a long way to go until we can get pure intention from robots. So in the handcrafted approach, controlling robotics uh, systems is achieved by having an assembly of smaller controllers. Um, think of it as a big problem that is being uh, split into bit-sized bit chunks, and each has to be tackled by a smaller program. And uh, finally, you have this ensemble of smaller controllers that give the final uh, control of the whole system. But because of this separation of systems, you will never be able to achieve full control, optimal control, because ev every, every level will introduce a bit of error. And that error is going to propagate throughout the system. So these controllers are known to be very hard to tune. And having them work together will always give this suboptimal sub solution for the current task. Um, these are very time consuming and capital intensive to, to build and deploy. And as uh, each controller has to be designed for a specific application. It's very hard to generalize. And it's very hard to, to, to share these controllers and make them work out of the box with other models or even with the same robots of the same model, because every robot will come with small little imperfections out of the box. Well, now let's think how the AI approach would look like. Let's imagine how um, in artificial intelligence could actually give some magic to, this, uh, to these robots. Firstly, the algorithms would be highly generalizable. This would enable them to be successfully applied to a range of different sized hardware platforms. Moreover, they will uh, be very adaptable to new environments and very easy to tune for new tasks with fast and cheap development time. Finally, you would have, what would you have with uh, AI without learning? The robot would be able to continuously learn to adapt to rapid changes in its environment and even learn from experiences of its peers. If these technologies would exist today, having a quadruped robot at your workplace would be as common as having pets. But how do you get from here to there? Well, we don't know the exact full path. We know the first couple of steps. And these first couple of steps are, called, um, are, are known as a research field called reinforcement learning, specifically deep reinforcement learning. But before diving deeper into the applicability of this subfield of uh, to, to locomotion, let's firstly recap the main concepts of reinforcement learning. So what is RL? 
We know that in supervised and imitation learning, it's all about human demonstrations. It's all about uh, learning um, from example, learning from labels and learning uh, from references. In reinforcement learning, however, the agent learns from its own experience by trial and error. There's no label or reference to look at. Instead, the agent accumulates rewards across short episodes of experience and tries to repeat actions that result in higher total rewards. This is the RL framework. So basically what's happening here is that the agent, okay, the agent starts in, um, let's say state S, it then takes an action A and transitions to state S1. At the same time, the environment rewards the agent for the taken action according to a specific reward function, which is created by the user or by the researcher. Uh, uh, given a couple of sequences of this um, state reward action, uh, you would end up with an episode. So an episode, it's uh, a chunk of experience. And this is how you would visualize these state actions and rewards. What you see here, it's a grid, grid sized um, world with an agent in the middle, and you have a couple of states in each uh, position. You have the, uh, the fire, which is the negative reward, and the diamond, which is the positive one. Um, the, the idea here is that the agent has to learn by itself to reach the diamond without uh, catching fire. So what it will do, it will try a couple of uh, steps randomly. It will find out that uh, reaching fire is going to give a negative reward, and it's going to start learning how to avoid that side of the, uh, the map so that it can find a shortcut to the diamond um, bypassing all these uh, traps. Um, learning a policy. So the policy is the map uh, and the, the, the brain of the robot. What it does, uh, as I mentioned, it starts exploring the, uh, the area and then it modifies the, uh, the steps it took so that it encourages the ones that led to the diamond instead of the ones that led to fire or death. <laughs> but there's a problem. You cannot have a grid sized um, environment for everything. For example, in uh, AlphaGo, in the documentary from DeepMind, they mentioned that the, um, the total space size, um, space state of AlphaGo, it's uh, larger than the number of atoms in the whole universe. So that means that uh, it's impossible to create a um, data structure that con can contain all possible actions in all possible states. So when, like, so, so then, what do you do? Well, there's no there's no way of applying computation. The solution would be to learn the metrics instead. So what you do, you apply the latest advancements in deep learning um, to these mappings. So you learn how to 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 map from states to actions. You know, now fish. a growing data set, you have a, a growing uh, data structure, you have this fixed size uh, neural network that can um, program itself to learn how to map from different high dimensional states to these actions. Um, throw in a gradient based uh, optimizer and then what you have is deep reinforcement learning. So take a look, it's exactly the same RL framework, but instead of a policy, uh, a grid size policy, we have the um, the neural network that takes the state and then outputs an agent uh, outputs an action. And this plus some other minor tricks, sud uh, tricks suddenly enables the um, agents to achieve superhuman performance in a range of games. So, for example, here you have the OpenAI gym environments. You have the um, the the moon lander, the Atari breakout and pong and all these control problems that were very difficult to solve uh, before, but now with deep reinforcement learning, they become uh, benchmark environments. So something that it's very easy to, to, uh, to solve. Um, yes, so reinforcement learning agents can be uh, divided into two categories, one policy and off policy. With on policy learning, agents learn a behavior policy, a di direct mapping between states and actions to take. They utilize the same policy for data generation Encourage, uh, encouraging actions that resulted in higher trajectory rewards. This leads to fast and stable convergence, but it can quickly become very data inefficient. As new policies have to generate new data, 
for each update. Two famous examples here are trust region policy optimization and proximal policy optimization. Let me see if I can remove this. I cannot. OK. Uh, on the other hand, we have off policy agents, which learn a behavior policy and also a Q function policy. This Q function policy actually predicts the expected total reward uh, of each state action um, so that the agent can use that as a reference when it learns. Because what, what, what it's trying to do is trying to find the optimal uh, action that maximizes the reward. So what will happen in this case? Uh, will be uh, that it will store these uh, sequences of um, experience in a buffer. And what it will do, it will be able to, to use the, the second policy to predict what would be the maximum, um, the, uh, the maximum reward it could get from there. And what it will do, it will train the current policy uh, used in taking actions to behave more like that uh, policy that can only take the optimal actions. Uh, uh, keep in mind that the off-policy um, agents will have uh, always this uh, epsilon. So epsilon is a parameter that defines randomness. So uh, um, a decision will always have a, a certain amount of randomness that would take it into a different direction that doesn't follow the policy. So then uh, it's, um, that's what is trying to optimize. Some examples are deep queue networks, um, the DPG and SAC, which are uh, evolutions of this uh, off policy, which combines some elements from on policy as well, which I'm going to explain in a bit. So um, now that we have a general idea of what reinforcement learning is, let's explore how this is being applied to the field of locomotion. And let's study some of the most recent papers um, and um, the techniques they use to achieve this uh, disabilities. One of the earliest works uh, involved the Sony Ibo robot dog. Surprisingly, many of the ideas pushed in uh, 2004 are still used to this day. This is a classical example of on-policy learning. Um, I'm going to play the robot quickly here. So what, what it does, uh, it's uh, very simple. It has a reference open loop gate. So you can think it uh, as a sinusoid. And it's just trying to mimic that sinusoid with the, with the limbs. So it uses uh, policy, uh, policy gradients to learn how to uh, behave according to these sinusoids. And because back then, computers weren't really able to do gradient descent, it uses um, some other optimization technique called hill climbing, which is um, creating these small perturbations in the weights and then testing the new policies with all these small changes in the weights and then choosing the one that ha gives the, the better reward. Uh, but then something happened. Um, so far, we had uh, you know, limited compute resources and the neural networks could only have a handful of nodes. And in a couple of years, the AI boom happened, and the neural networks were proven to be very successful in image recognition. Since then, we've seen a rapid development in learning algorithms, computer graphics, distributed systems, and insane amounts uh, of funding towards the field. Couple this with new talent going into the industry and academia, and then the fast pace of AI growth starts making sense. One of these areas to, uh, that was shown a lot of interest was simulation. Good simulation is a cheap and abundant source of, of data, and one of the requirements that make deep neural, deep neural ah, deep nets <laughs> work so well uh, is uh, is data. OpenAI and DeepBind were pioneers in developing benchmark environments for advanced reinforcement learning agents. While Mujoku rapidly became the go-to simulation platform, we also had open source alternatives such as PyBullet, uh, which also became very used. So th these are some of the benchmark, um, some of the benchmark environments that are used in uh, uh, these uh, reinforcement learning uh, gyms um, that test the latest capabilities of uh, adaptability of general uh, generability. So one agent would be able to control all these robots. As mentioned, uh, DeepMind are the leaders when it comes to sim using simulation for showcasing the learning capabilities of their algorithms. In this paper, learning from uh, complex environments, the author shows the intelligent behaviors that can emerge from only scaling the, 
the uh, reinforced learning agents and using very complex uh, environments to uh, to um, to modulate the behavior instead of having complex rewards. So if we have a quick look of the agents. How, if you can imagine, this is very hard to um, hard code to to uh, encode in a reward function. So what they do here, they use massive scaling uh, of algorithms, and they they train sixteen or more agents at the same time, and they collect all this experience and all these uh, different uh, actions they each took to find out the actual um, solution to these problems. So it knows how to avoid these obstacles. So what you see here. Um, it's what the agent learned in hundreds of hours of experimentation. Yes, so what, what they used here was PPO, which is an on-policy um, agent. Um, which, as mentioned, they uh, these on-policy agents require a lot of data. So simulation is a very good match for on-policy learning. Uh, okay, let's let's see the next paper. So the next paper is uh, it was released at the same time with the other one uh, from DeepMind as well. What uh, they showcased here was how to learn adversarial imitation. So they used this um, neural network, a Gale, which is uh, basically GANs for imitating policies which enabled training uh, general neural networks that produce human-like movement patterns from uh, limited motion capture demonstrations. So what they did during training was to capture some of these human-like behaviors, so like crouching or like walking weirdly. And what they did, they trained a neural network to create these new um, policies that would look very similar to the actual reference uh, policies. Uh, and then, they use this in uh, the uh, in the same environment showed here to create uh, this uh, modular uh, hierarchical reinforcement learning system, which means that uh, higher level reinforcement learning learns how to control the behavioral policy to um, ma manipulate it uh, for achieving certain tasks. So if you can see here, for example, crouching, it learns how to use this uh, crouching policy to juggle between uh, the obstacles. So, so far we, we've seen how uh, these policies are behaving in simulation. And I wanted to present you some of the latest work uh, uh, that explores how to put this on the actual robots. So sim to real is the process of bringing policies learned in simulation to the real world robots. In this work from Google Brain and DeepMind, they showed how a locomotion controller learned in simulation and can be successfully transferred to the Minitor robot using a technique called domain randomization. So domain randomization consists in um, randomizing environment uh, and uh, the parameters, such as the, the motors or the gravity or the, the, the floor friction and so on. And uh, by randomizing this, uh, the agent is uh, being enabled uh, it is, is becoming more, more versed in dealing with different environments and dealing with these very small differences in, uh, in, uh, in the real world or in its own body. Um, so much that uh, when deployed to the actual hardware in the real world, we'll consider the world just a small, uh, you know, a, a small difference uh, of the previous environments. Uh, they, they keep the reward function very simple here. So the only um, reward is going forward and they have a slight penalization of the torques just to keep the energy effic efficiency in, uh, in place. And they showcased how uh, these techniques combined together can um, achieve real control on the real hardware. So this is the stage where they used PPO to train these agents in simulation. And they uh, they showcased how these simulations would uh, transfer to the actual 
a real world robot. So because they so they tried with multiple gates, but because the simulation is static and the world is very different, it's very hard to transfer it right away. So the the best solution they achieved here. Give me one second. Hmm. Yeah, I cannot skip it. So what they achieved here was the. Oh, okay. So I can double click on it. All right. So they, what they achieved, they achieved to transfer the same policy into the real world just by changing the environment and randomizing a lot of the parameters such as the, uh, the weight of the limbs and the uh, gravity and the friction of the floor. And in uh, the same team, um, ETH presents uh, something similar but taking to a whole new level. What they do, they use their animal quadruped, which is a much more complex system than Minitor. Instead of open loop trajectories, so uh, previously Minitor was um, following some sinusoids for moving the arms. Uh, now they describe the foot placements with a very complex reward functions. And additionally, they choose to learn the dynamics of the actuators uh, in a supervised learning fashion. What the Minitor robot did was to use very accurate uh, motors. So they describe it at the, you know, the equation level and the dynamics level. But um, in this paper, they choose to, to learn how uh, the uh, motor dynamics behave uh, through uh, measuring, um, measuring the torques while sending certain commands and then learning uh, neural networks that mimic the same uh, dynamics in the simulation. So coupling this with the same uh, domain randomization and a very powerful and fast uh, simulator they have in ETH, they achieved a very powerful overall policy. So what they show here, they show that they learn a couple of um, behaviors besides uh, locomotion, such as um, such as recovery and such as uh, having a, um, Being able to to support all these different forces to left and right, being hit, uh, you know, being tackled. I'm not really sure if everyone can can hear the volume. Karina, can you not hear it? No, no volume. Ah, this is interesting. Okay. Never mind. I'll have all these uh, in the slides afterwards. So if you're more interested into them, you can uh, check them out. All right. So so far, we've seen how uh, reinforcement learning in simulation can be applied into the uh, real world through domain uh, to ran domain randomization. Now let's look how the these learners can actually learn into the real world. Um, so the first paper I want to discuss. Um, uh, it's uh, coming from Berkeley, Berkeley University, and they discuss how these off-policy uh, learners can actually make robots learn into the real world very efficiently. Um, what they do here, uh, they uh, use this uh, exploration exploitation trade-off to they, they they make it so it's uh, it's optimizable. So the algorithms learn how to optimize this. Um, exploration exploitation trade-off by themselves. So that um, uh, what, what they do is when the policy becomes more advanced, it can move itself towards uh, exploitation. So it knows that it has to um, become better in, in the policy versus if it's a bit earlier than it should, it knows that it, ha it still has to explore more. So it doesn't have to optimize that fast. It's quite hard to, to explain it without an example. So we're going to see the example in a second. 
But as mentioned, what I uh, what, what I said about data efficiency is that this uh, asynchronous uh, asynchronous learning system separates data collection from training. So the robot ex uh, robots experience and rewards generated from motion capture data are streamed into the replay buffer. The workstation um, samples from these uh, trajectories updates the policy, updates the Q network, which again uh, predicts the, the the maximum uh, values the the actions should be and the entropy parameter which is the uh, the trade off between uh, efficiency and uh, between uh, exploration and exploitation so putting all these together we can see that okay oops So we, we can see how this learning in the real world uh, actually can happen efficiently. So eventually it learns. Uh, yes, let's move on because apparently <laughs> um, there, there's a lot of information I still want to go through. There's another uh, interesting approach um, in which they, they try to imitate uh, animal behavior. So this recent work uh, from Google, um, they, they, they try to first collect animal locomotion behaviors with motion capture and then import it into simulation. Next, they try to extort the key. They try to extract the key uh, uh, key joints uh, from animation so that they can generate these reference motions with the uh, the robot in simulation. This robot is called Lycago, by the way. So I'll just uh, call it Lycago. They try to uh, create these uh, reference uh, trajectories of Lycago using inverse kinematics, which basically means you have a point in uh, 3D and the algorithms are trying to solve how to move the joints so that the, uh, the feet can reach that point. The novelty here, uh, however, comes from uh, their uh, tackling of domain adaptation. Uh, besides randomizing the environments, they encode these latent parameters into a vector, which actually just refer to how the uh, uh, environment is being changed. So if you think of uh, gravity and um, friction and all these, these are encoded in separate vectors and they're fitted into the networks. So they understand uh, the environment they're in. And what they do here, when you apply it into the real world, they don't have this vector and they're trying to learn it. So they're trying from previous experience, they know how you know certain level of friction actually should look like in the vector. They're trying to create this vector of their own with the parameters of uh, the real world. And this leads to more efficient um, domain adaptation, rather than just uh, going through a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, simulation. We present a framework that enables legged robots to learn agile skills by imitating animals via a sample efficient domain adaptation technique. Body, such so as the feet this is um, corresponding key points are then specified. So this is uh, how they choose these uh, key points of the joints and of the of the feet, and then they they use it to create this uh, white uh, reference model, and they train this imitation uh, policy to just imitate the uh, the reference. So th the loss is mainly supervised learning. It's an L two loss. So th these are some of the uh, the. Uh, the parameters that are being embedded into the uh, into the vector and fed into the real uh, neural network. So here we can see how the robot behaves be, uh, 
as you transfer it without this vector, and then you see how it actually learns the um, uh, the parameters of the real world. Okay, I have a couple more papers. Karina, can you tell me how I'm on time? Yeah, I'm keen to learn about many more papers. Okay, great. I don't okay. know if everyone feels the same way. So if you don't feel that way, protest in the in the chat. All right. Probably I should be done in five, uh, ten minutes. All right. All right. So these papers are full of detail, but it's very hard to go in depth in uh, such a short presentation. So I'll put everything, all the links to the papers and everything in the slides. Afterwards, you can go into them and uh, check them out. So the next trend is called meta learning. Um, everything you, we've seen so far um, are the policies and agents trained for specific tasks in uh, specific environments. However, this is still far away from the envisioned AI approach, which I presented earlier in the talk. Uh, we would like to have these agents that can quickly achieve new goals uh, and learn new tasks and operate in new mediums. Meta learning presents itself as a very promising direction in the machine learning uh, field where neural networks can accumulate a prior of the information over a range of tasks. Similar to how transfer learning works in uh, computer vision and NLP, where big nets can just uh, be fine-tuned for specific tasks or uh, image recognition uh, uh, goals. These meta-learning uh, networks can be, uh, encapsulate useful information so that agents can then learn to perform new tasks in just a few tries. Uh, you can perceive this as a gradient-based technique for weight initialization. Uh, yeah, so let's look at the graphic. Um, for the same set of parameters, we compute individual gradient, gradients for each task. So what we, you see here as L1, L2, L3 are three different tasks. Um, you can take them as walk forward, walk backward, walk, uh, walk sideways. So what uh, the algorithm does, it creates these different gradients and then it summarizes them in a bigger gradient of the meta learner. So the meta learner will take a gradient step in the parameter space um, towards these three uh, goals. So it's gonna be something uh, common for everyone so that at every meta learner step, uh, every policy gets improved. And the, learn the training here plateaus when meta learner reaches a point in the parameter space where additional updates would hurt one or more of the tasks. So let's try to visualize uh, what's happening. So this is at gradient zero when the, um, the cheetah is, is trying to uh, figure, out, figure out what's happening. But as soon as we make an update uh, um, towards our goal, so our, go our goal can be walk forward or walk backward, uh, it can achieve that goal very fast because it has a prior of how it should walk. So it knows how to walk, it only needs a goal. So the goal is go backwards, it knows that, and it able, it's able to adapt very fast. And uh, th this is one of the trends of uh, embedding a lot of information into the algorithms before deploying them or before training them for certain tasks. Um, an alternative to that, uh, it's unsupervised learning which is used in uh, the context of reinforcement learning for uh, presenting um, an alternative, uh, presenting itself as an alternative to uh, reward engineering. So the DADS algorithm, which is dynamic aware discovery of skills, is an algorithm that discovers predictable behaviors and learns their dynamics. For example, you have a setting where you train 16 agents, let's say. At some point in time, one of them will learn um, that placing their feet in certain positions at certain uh, frequency will advance their bodies forward. Then agents will hold onto these behaviors and end up learning a new locomotion policy at a certain, play, uh, at a certain pace with a predictable uh, change in the environment. Um, so what happens here is that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the intrinsic reward it doesn't reward based on achieving a goal. It rewards based on learning a policy that can be predictable and it can create a change in the environment. So walking forward 
creates a change in the environment and it's also predictable. And this predictability uh, is important because the algorithm also learns um, how to predict. So it learns the, the model of the world. And the model of the world is basically learning which state comes after. So if you take a, uh, you know, a step with the left foot, you know in which position you'll be. And this is very important and very interesting here that because this skill dynamics net can be leveraged to, um, to be used in a higher level network that will uh, create uh, higher level tasks without using simulation. So if the lower level network learns how to walk and it learns how walking in this direction would change environment, the higher level network will know how to modulate that behavior so that it can make the agent uh, reach certain targets without actually trying it out in, um, in the world. So you can imagine uh, if uh, a switch is like three meters away and I know that you know, in three meters I make five steps, uh, I know that making five steps is gonna get me to that goal. And this can be visualized here. So what happens, the unsupervised learning uh, algorithm learn how to move uh, with different policies for different directions. And the higher level um, neural network learns how to control or how to send directions, let's say, to that lower level network to achieve these green um, targets in, in space. So I know this has been a lot of information, um, but we've seen a couple of common patterns uh, among these papers. First, on policy learning works the best when it, it's in simulation, where data is abundant and cheap. Domain randomization is also a technique for helping agents uh, deal with this variation in their environments, which allows them to cope with the slight changes in dynamics of the real world. Of policy learning uh, presents itself as a solution for training in the real world, which is uh, a very big focus currently on. Uh, for data efficiency and for deploying these systems in the real world directly instead of uh, having them pre-trained in simulation. There is also a trend for encoding environment parameters and feeding them to the policy and um, uh, having more information about what's going on in the environment instead of just training on random environments. And this uh, was shown that it uh, creates a better understanding of what's happening and how to adapt. And finally, these intrinsic reward systems allow unsupervised learners or meta learners to discover new skills and goals by themselves, which removes the need for complex handcrafted goals and improves their general ability. I would like to close with a couple of resources I found very useful if you'd like to uh, consider getting into the space. So firstly, courses, I find the Stanford and the uh, DeepMind courses uh, very well done for, uh, getting familiarized with reinforcement learning and how all these um, uh, state reward action uh, sequences uh, function together. And then you can move on to the deep reinforcement learning courses, uh, which um, are uh, the best, uh, for, for which the best courses would be from Berkeley and OpenAI. Um, they go um, in detail through all these meta learning and all the unsupervised learning uh, uh, papers and uh, techniques I've showed around. And uh, if you'd like to try some of these, you can check out the stable baselines tree and open AI baselines libraries from, um, from GitHub. Uh, they're both in PyTorch, so that's great. Uh, and in terms of environments, you have Monjoko, PyBullet as mentioned, but also the ML agents from Unity and from DeepMind, you have DM control and OpenSPL, which um, uh, DeepMind control is based on Monjoko. Uh, but OpenSpiel is based on um, playing cards. I'm not really sure if uh, it requires any paid simulator as a backend, but it's a different environment for different tasks, uh, which are not considered benchmark. So that's more uh, interesting to explore. Finally, you have these pre-trained agents um, that are already trained. Uh, if you'd like just to see something in action, you can take one of these and put them in whatever environment you want, and you'll see them uh, behave there. Uh, staying up to date, it's always important. You have these uh, blogs and uh, Twitter uh, accounts from the latest uh, research uh, labs and uh, researchers. And also from YouTube, I found a couple of channels very interesting. 
Henry AI and uh, Yannick Kilcher, they're a bit unknown, but they always post the latest papers uh, uh, described in detail. Two minute papers, everyone knows about it, and Lex Friedman as well. So yes, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Roland. Thank you. In real life, you would have a round of applause, but I reckon <laughs> on this platform, you can just imagine that we all really appreciated the talk. So I'll start by jumping in with a question because I can. Uh, so unless I missed something, you were always talking about uh, basically taking an untrained network and then training it until yes. it performs. Have there been a lot of explorations of how you could do it several times and then when you have several instances of the same network trained, you could combine it? You mean like an ensemble of networks? Yeah, like if you train the same network several times and it learns how to walk, but maybe mm -hmm. one of them knows some tricks that the other hasn't learned. But yes, this is this is the uh, yes, this is the meta learning uh, thing. Let me go back. So what what's happening here? You have uh, you, you know how uh, transfer learning works in uh, vision and NLP, right? So you have like this big you know network. Oops. That, um, give me a second. Yes, that contains all this information about ImageNet or other bodies of text or whatever, and then you can just find it, fine tune them to specific tasks. So meta learning, it's uh, the same, the same kind of uh, concept, but for reinforcement learning. So you can train it on a couple of um, tasks. So it can be, let's say, walking, or it can be jumping, or whatever. And what it does, it gets to a point. Uh, from which is very easy to fine tune on a task that you, you'd you like. It can be something you've trained on or something that you haven't trained on. So uh, as you said, it can take attributes from, for example, from jumping and walking forward. It can learn very fast how to jump forward. I see. So there's a question from Magnus. OK. In the chat. Would you like to address that? Yes, let me check. And yeah, for everyone, if you have a question, either type it in or just type in the word Q or question and I'll call out your name and then you can unmute, your, unmute yourself and actually ask the question in real life. Okay, so, um, so what do you mean? Oh, so you mean like, why won't they just like work? Um, so it depends. It depends if you, if you mean in simulation or in the real world. So can you hear me? Yeah, what I mean is essentially, um, if you look at the way that, that a dog moves, it's much more natural and spontaneous than the way that these models are are moving, even in simulation. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, that 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 reflects a different approach to control, or do you think it, it's just a limitation of the so, biomechanic of the model, or do you think it's something else? So if you think of the dog, dog, it's a result of million of years of evolution. And that evolution and that DNA um, has a lot of information of how it should move and how it should interact and how it should, like how the instincts instincts should work so that it's kept alive, basically. Um, so the dog wasn't born with no information at all and learned, you know, like from zero. It has a lot of prior knowledge, and that's similar to meta learning. Meta learning uh, embeds a lot of prior knowledge into, a, you know. A new network, let's say, and then when you show it an example, it learns very fast what you mean by that example, or it learns how to move. And real dogs are the same. Um, so the the promise with reinforcement learning is to have this prior that can be shared and contributed to by all the robots or you know different uh, agents in the real world or in simulation or whatever, um, because learning something from zero. Um, takes for for example, you have the the paper with the the that w where they try to mimic this ro robot dog, right? So it learns some of these behaviors and some of these um, uh, attributes that are not uh, seen in uh, normal control. But these small attributes, they're not optimal. They're imperfections from from evolution. Optimal control is when you make the least amount of mov movement to achieve something. So if you if you want to, you know, 
Uh, th that's why robots work so robotic, because they make the least amount of mov movements or actions to achieve a task. So these agents, if you train them from scratch, they, yeah, I, I think I went to different uh, directions, but when they train, when you train them for a certain task for like moving forward, will optimize only for moving forward and not for doing anything else. Yeah, if I mean, I think that's what maybe I was trying to guess at was maybe they're, they're finding a local optimum um, in the in the space. Yes, because space. they don't have this prior of different stuff. So a dog whether, it's, many or whether, whether they're just not sampling a big enough domain of possible actions, I don't know. Yes, but yes. That's the limitation exactly. of the algorithm. I'm not sure. That's what I was kind of getting at. But... Yes, because, because a dog has a lot of prior knowledge of everything that it has to do. So if he's walking on the street, it the instincts has to be have to be there. It has to be able to jump, you know, aside. It has to be able to run. It has to be able to go back. A robot is not able to do any of these. So it doesn't have the prior knowledge that it would give it a different kind of walking. Um, as you've seen with the uh, half cheetah, with the meta learning example, when it stays, the optimal, you know. Optimal thing would be to stay put, but it doesn't stay put. It it moves a lot. It moves mm -hmm. a lot because it has all this information about different actions that it can take. Yeah. So it's the same the same concept. Thanks. Right. There is also an interesting question from Emma in the chat. Okay. Let me check. Okay, so uh, yes, so the replay buffers are, um, so with off policy learning, let me go back to the slide. Okay, so you have a couple of attributes here. You have the uh, one, one of them being being able to train on randomized data collected with different policies. So what it means here is that uh, compared to on policy, which uses one single, uh, you know, one, one single data set, uh, these uh, buffers use uh, randomized data, which most of the time are prioritized. So um, more important data, which is not that often put into the buffer, let's say, is being given more importance. So that will be used uh, for training more often than others. Uh, and these da uh, data samples can come from uh, previously trained policies as well. So in that case, it's soft policy because it uses data generated by a previous um, policy. So um, by tweaking what is stored in the buffer, there hasn't been any research about that. What you can do is just you know have a neural network that takes data and does something. Yeah, so basically, if you have to, let's say, move sideways and you have one example of that, you train on that, and then with a better policy, you move sideways in a more optimal way. And then you put that back into the um, buffer, and that's a more optimized, better, uh, you know, trajectory. That it just replaces the it, it replaces the old one. So you store the most successful uh, samples or trajectories then by that approach. Um, can, can you repeat that again? Sorry, so from what you were just saying, that approach is that you store the most successful trajectories. So the best example of moving sideways replaces a worse previous experience of moving sideways. Yes, because the buffer has uh, uh, a fixed size. So if you have, let's say, side move, uh, move sideways and it learns from that, that's kind of put at the bottom and it's disregarded as new information comes in. So if new information about moving sideways in a better way comes in, they're going to train on that. So that way, the the, the data uh, in the buffer is going to be always up to date. But at the same time, it will still keep uh, trajectories that are not that often in the buffer compared to on policy, which disregards everything. Uh, this buffer keeps the most important bits from different uh, different policies and you know different collections. Great, thanks very much. Thank you. All right, and we have another question from Brian as well. Yes.
Yes, so uh, domain randomization uh, is used so that the model doesn't overfit on the current parameters of the world. So it doesn't overfit of, like it, if it only knows about having a certain weight or the, the floor be having a certain uh, level of friction, it will not know how to adapt. So by tweaking these parameters and tweaking a lot of uh, these attributes, every time you train, it will learn how to adapt to all these various environments. Um, in the ETH paper, they also used a lot of external forces. So during training, a lot of uh, pushing and you know uh, dragging is being used so that the robot knows how to uh, self-calibrate after being pushed. That's why the guy was pushing it with the leg because um, that was an external force that it actually trained on. So it would know how to uh, react to that. Well, and um, there is a question from Schult as well. Yes. Uh, okay, so it's not uh, a Bayesian type. Okay, so the question is, uh, is the prior uh, the same sort of a Bayesian prior? Is not. Uh, the Bayesian prior is basically a probability. Uh, what's happening? It, yeah, it, it's not really. So there, there is a meta learner uh, uh, algorithm that uses uh, Bayesian inference, and then you actually have a, a distribution over the um, uh, uh, parameter space. But in this example, this is the vanilla version. So it only uses a point in uh, parameter space. And what I mean by prior, I mean just a baggage of information about all the other uh, tasks it has to do. It's not related to Bayesian inference, so it's not like an actual Bayesian prior. Uh, but that concept is used as well. And I think the paper is called, j just search for meta learning uh, Bayesian, and you're going to find a Bayesian version of that. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. I think we've had a good collection of questions. And I hope you, Roland, will have time to join us for networking later. So, yes, for sure. Be more in person with more in depth questions. But for sure. Uh, let's say thank you to Roland one more time. Imagine a big round of applause. <laughs>